Yes, so hello, my name is Stefan Nyman. I'm a corporate trainer and consultant with the CC in, uh, in Denmark in the headquarters. I've been with them 15 years. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer back in 1996 and I've been with uh, Alpha Laval. I've been with Grundfos, it's a Danish pump manufacturer. And, um, and the last seven years also working as a licensed partner with the Noria Corporation, you know, the American company, uh, through a, a licensed partner a company called Clean Oil Consult here in Denmark. Um, these uh, certifications here, ICML, I don't know if you know them, but there's a ICML a machinery lubrication technician and machinery lubrication analyst, and I'm level two on both of them. Yes, so that was very briefly about me. Um, today we'll be discussing uh, contamination, what they will do to machines and oil, and uh, the difference between an inline and an offline filter type. So you would say depth media versus uh, more thinner media, and uh, why we have two types uh, for that. Uh, there may be a, a potential or an optional um, other a future webinar where we can talk about sampling and analysis best practice and which analysis will verify everything is okay maybe some online monitoring and so on and that uh, we may offer um, yeah as soon as possible if you're interested in that you could then contact your your normal CC instant contact so uh, to start with, I want to say that the lubrication oil is actually like the lifeblood of the machine. You know, it's like in engines, gearboxes, hydraulic system and so on. It's very, very important that you have good, clean uh, oil in there. It's similar like your body is having good uh, blood. If your blood having bacteria and illnesses in your blood, you will get ill. The same with the machines. So. Um, what we want to do is we want to keep it clean, but unfortunately during any operation the lubrication oil will be contaminated with particles, water, acidity and oxidation is part of the same thing. That will reduce the lifetime of the machine, the reliability will be harmed and the efficiency as well. Um, and, break, and the studies have shown that 80% of oil related breakdowns are actually due to contaminated oil. So there's a huge amount of money uh, in actually um, cleaning the oil and uh, keeping it cool, clean and dry, as Noria say. In Sessiensen, uh, we're working with a principle called offline filtration, or kidney loop also called. And uh, there's a, a very good business case around that. Um, the, so if you compare to the inline filter here, the inline filter in the gearbox is supplying oil directly to the gear mesh and to the bearings and so on. Uh, but this filter is living a very tough life because of starting and stopping of a pump and, and other shock waves and so on. Uh, while the offline filter is connected to the bottom, to the sump here, and draws oil out as a slow pace and continuously filtering 24 hours back to the gearbox, hydraulic system, turbine or whatever we were working with. So. Um, the, the good business case is primarily because you can reduce the cost for filtration, uh, mainly because the filters hold a lot more dirt, so the dirt hold capacity is, is very big. Typically, two to four kilograms per insert, that will be four to eight pounds in, in US. Um, and uh, CCNs was uh, one of the first companies in the world to work with offline filtration. We'll get back to the difference between inline and offline here at the end of uh, this, so in, buff, in about 25, 30 minutes. Um, the other company I work with called Clean Oil Consult, you can see there's a web page here. We do uh, uh, training for Noria in Denmark, now in Sweden, uh, primarily Denmark at the moment. But um, yeah, you're welcome to, to see the, the web page here. So the topics of today uh, is uh, why it's important to work with clean oil. What about particles? What do they do? Water, varnish, and when fuel or diesel comes into uh, lube oil, that's engines. Um, and we'll talk, like I say, inline versus offline filter, and then end with some Q&A session. If you have questions on the way, like I say, you're welcome to type it into the instant message field. You may know that a lot of machines already have an inline filter, the pressure filter built in, uh, which is taking care of the particles primarily, but they're not designed to keep the oil clean and make it cleaner and cleaner. So 
very often the oil would actually be more and more contaminated over the period of time. Uh, also, the inline filters do not remove water, varnish, and sludge. So the uh, could I say you're only focusing on particles. If you have a very good quality uh, um, and very fine inline filter, it could be very, very expensive to run. So if you have a turbine, for example, with a three or five micron inline pressure filter, they are typically very big and quite expensive. So uh, you could do it different, uh, in a different way, and we'll go back to that, so combining more types of filters. And there is a direct correlation between uh, the contamination of the oil and then the cost for running. So you'll be having more wear if your uh, oil is contaminated, you'll have more downtime, you'll spend more money on oil and components. Uh, so the cost of ownership is uh, increasing if the oil is dirty. So the if you want to save money and they have a lower total cost of ownership, you need to work with the oil. Uh, one way of doing it is uh, using an offline filter. Now this is a CTC filter, but other offline filters are obviously available. Uh, so what they do is they draw the oil from the bottom of the tank, or the bottom of the sump, you could say, and slowly push it through a depth meter filter and clean the oil. What happens is, after some time, typically, depending on how dirty the system is, between five and ten times circulation, the oil will get very clean. Then the oil would start to pick up dirt and varnish and water that is hanging around in the uh, oil system. So on plate heat exchanges, on other, you know, the bottom and so on. So it may take 20 times, it may take, you know, up several hundred times circulation before the oil and the system is actually clean. Um, but if you do it the right way, you can actually keep the oil clean and make the components and oil last longer. So the, um, uh, the, the three main um, uh, contamination we'll look at is the first we'll look at particles. The problem with particles is that uh, you cannot see them, those that are harmful in, for the oil system. Uh, the diameter of a human hair is around 70 micron, uh, and a micron is a thousand of a millimeter, uh, and a dust particle dancing in the, with the window will be roughly 40 micron. This is very, very small. And in an oil, if you took oil out in your hand or you look at an oil sample, you will not be able to see 40 microns like you can in air. In an oil, you'll be able to see a particle of plus 100, 150 micron or bigger, but not smaller. The problem is the majority of the particles that are very harmful for your oil system are actually in the region of like one micron, so tobacco smoke, or three micron like bacteria sizes. So very, very, very small particles are harming your machines. And unfortunately, there's a lot of these small particles. Uh, so if we look at the, uh, uh, the, the small particles, they are roughly 70% of them are below five microns. So really, really, really small particles, and the majority of them are that small. If you go to about 10 microns, you see about 10% are bigger. That means 90% of the particles found in an oil system will be smaller than 10 micron. And why is it so? Well, if you think about a bigger particles like a, a dust, speck of dust, 40 micron, that comes into a gearbox, uh, uh, yeah, roller bearing or whatever, and it's being crushed, that particle will generate thousands of small micron of like one, five, ten micron particles. So there will always be way more of the small one than the bigger one. And also, the bigger particles are much easier to filter out with a standard inline filter. So you'll typically have a curve like that, showing a lot of particles in the smaller sizes. Um, so if you have a, a like a, a roller bearing or a, a um, journal bearing like shown here, and you have room for maybe 10 micron uh, where the oil is pumped in, but there's only room for one or five micron in the load zone, then you'll have metal to metal contact, polarization of the particles, uh, and that will create something called micro pitting. I'll show you some photos in a moment, but this is small cracks in the surface that is uh, slowly getting bigger and bigger. And especially when we're talking gears and roller bearings like this, there's very, very high pressure in this load zone. It's actually so high pressure that it deforms. It's called elasto-hydrodynamic uh, lubrication. So the, the bearing is actually 
elastic because of the so high pressure. It's more than 35,000 bar, which I believe is something like, what is that in PSI, 150,000 maybe, something like that. Very, very, very high pressure. So you're actually deforming the ball and the racetrack. So of course a sand particle is very easily being crushed but sand is harder than steel even hardened steel so a dust in the air or sand will easily destroy my surface and that will look like you see here this is from a uh, from a coal mill so yes it is a contaminated area but you can see here these spalls or these uh, cracks uh, and that's because it, the surface is failing When we're looking for these particles, we often use something called particle counting. And this is, uh, we're counting particles according to the ISO standard, ISO 4406, uh, or some are using NAS standard. Uh, the NAS standard was actually changed back in 2001, I think it was, to an AES. But yeah, it's still being used, uh, especially in offshore and uh, marine and so on. But um, here you see a couple of membranes, and uh, the reason I like to show the membranes uh, together with an ISO on NAS count is because everybody can see the black one here at the bottom. This is a dirty membrane. So if you ran oil through that and it looked like this, and here we zoom in on the membrane, it looks like, you know, the moon more or less. Yeah, there's a lot of dirt. and the numbers are high, so NAS12 on ISO count 23. So compared to one with an ISO 11, uh, 9, 6 and a NAS0, you can see there's a big difference on the membrane. Um, mostly people are not using membranes, but they're actually using um, yeah, an, um, a laser particle counter that is counting the, could I say, the shadow of the particles that are obstructing the light. and and this will then give a number of particles. For example, uh, using a table, this 446 is a table here, where we're using uh, the, the particles and putting or converting into a class. Now this table here is uh, uh, for 100 milliliter of oil. Some of you may be using one milliliter of oil, so the numbers you see here will be, you know, 100 times smaller on some of the tables you see in the US. So in Europe, we use 100 milliliter. Um, so as an example here, if we count, this is a, a, a new oil from a drum. We count the particles, uh, 450,000 particles big or equal to 4 micron, 120,000 big or equal to 6 micron, and 14,000 uh, big or equal to 14 micron. Instead of saying all this, I can move the numbers into this table. So 450,000 is between 250,000 and half a million. That gives me a class 19. 120,000 is between 64,000 and 130,000. That is a class 17. 14,000 is between 8,000 and 16,000. So that's a class 14. So instead of saying this, I can say ISO code 19 slash 17 slash 14. It means this, so max half a million particles in 100 milliliter of oil, um, and that will be my four microns and bigger. You can see it says big or equal to. So the six, the 14 microns are included in the four micron. Um, what this table doesn't tell you is how I actually got the numbers. So the 450,000 particles in the 100 mil, how did I get that? Did I get it with the laser particle counter or did I get it with the uh, pore blockage or flow decay method or was I using a membrane like I showed you before? It doesn't tell me that. So you can only compare the numbers if you're using the same technology or the same method for counting. Otherwise, they, there may be a difference. So using different labs, you will see a difference in these ISO counts. Um, so a class 19 in one lab could be a 20 in another lab or an 18. Um, and as you can see, every time you are increasing one number, you're actually doubling the particle. So yeah, up to double, but of course there's a difference here, maybe only a, a few hundred or a few thousand, you can actually go to the next class. Uh, so it, I like to have, you know, both the numbers of particles and then the class. Uh, but cleaning an oil, for example, this oil here in 1917-14, cleaning that and get it to an, instead of 19, get it to a class 16, you can see I reduce half, half and half again. So 64,000 compared to half a million, that's 
quite a fall. Um, yes. So, and why you want to clean uh, the oil is uh, because of, of this, for example. If you have a, an ISO class of like uh, unfiltered, new unfiltered oil, like I showed you before in 1917-14, that is similar to an S8. Uh, this you can use for low loaded gears, low pressure hydraulic systems and so on. But what you're doing, if you're running this system for 150 liter an hour, uh, a liter a minute pump, so the main pump, 20 hours a day, 200 days a year. This will circulate 36 kilos or something like 70 pounds of dirt per year over that main pump. That will, of course, wear the pump. While if you had a 16, 14, 11 instead, or an S5, you would only be circulating four kilograms or eight pounds. So eight pound versus 70 pound, there's a big, big difference. So of course you'll be wearing out your pump. And the cleaner oil here says, is suitable for servo valves, high pressure hydraulic, common rail diesel, and so on. Uh, so the more of the dirty oil you circulate over the system, the more you wear. I've seen systems here in mining and cement, for example, where you're working with these ISO cars or NAS 11, and they get maybe three to six months life on a pump. So that is maximum maybe 4,000 hours. That is not good. I've also seen pumps working in clean oil that are 50 or 60,000 hours old and still functioning fine. So between 4,000 and 50,000, there's a big difference in the, you know how long you can have a pump lasting. Uh, this I collected from a lot of different supplier of uh, com um, uh, systems here. So. Uh, um, it's not all of them I agree fully with. Um, for example, gear, here, the recommended for gears is an ISO code 181613. I would think that you need cleaner actually for gears, but yeah, that's what the OEM says or the manufacturers. You can see here for engine lubiles, it says 1.5% weight, and that's because uh, engine oil is typically very dark, so you cannot shoot a light through it and count the particles. Some labs are doing it, but they're diluting the oil maybe one to a hundred or something. And then you're actually not looking at the particles in the lube oil, but rather in the solvent. So I would recommend to use a weight percentage instead. Um, but it's recommended if you want to extend the life that you run with an ISO code 16, 14, 11 or better. Uh, so for all systems here, you can see uh, hydraulic, gears, roller bearings, turbines, diesel, and so on. Engine could be difficult to run that clean, but most of the others is, is definitely possible. And why you want to do that? Yeah, now you can see this Noria table here. Each of the quadrants here are lighting up. That's because it depends on the, the machine type, how much uh, you can extend the life. So this table here for uh, where you have your the gray area here is the current cleanliness of the oil, and you got your red area here with the expected cleanliness of what you want to get to. And let's say that I have a system here, a hydraulic system, with an ISO code of 211916, and I clean it to a 161411. What will happen if it's a hydraulic? So I go from the 211916 here sideways to the to come to the 161411, and this corner here where it says four, that's my hydraulic and diesel engine. If it was a turbine, it would be three times longer life. It was roller bearings, two and a half, and gearbox another two times. So between two and four times longer life of the components if I cleaned it from this ISO code to the other. Now it says, you will see here that some says, you know, uh, 1.7, that's 70% extra and so on. But some are also saying above 10. Um, well, if you do it like in a lab and theoretical, of course you can do very good life extension. And, and of course that is possible, but in real life, typically you do not see a machine that is running this dirty here. So a 24, 22, 19, that will be a, a crusher, for example, in a mine site that is with a dust seal and all seals are broken. Then you cannot clean it to a 15, 13, 10. So yes, it's possible, but in real life, it's actually not. In real life, 
a machine that is leaking so much dust in will never be so clean. It will maybe be clean at an 18, 16, 13, and then six times longer life. But it will, you know, it will not be a hydraulic system, no gearbox, so that's one. So two and a half, three times. But, but 10 times you will probably not see in real life. Um, however, it's a very good table to help you to justify uh, cleaning the oil and get some much better life out of that. So we didn't like particles in oil because they destroyed our pumps, our valves, our everything. Um, what about water? Yeah, water is also destroying my components uh, because of different things. Well, water can um, do something called micro pitting. That is, uh, you see here a roller bearing. There's extremely high pressure in such a roller bearing. And the oil can actually solidify under this very high pressure, but water cannot. The water will collapse on itself, so implode, so the, op, uh, the, uh, um, the um, yeah, not an explosion, but an implosion, and the water droplets will collapse on itself and create a very high intensity of energy pushing uh, towards the surfaces and create uh, a pit, so a small crack. And next time a ball is passing that crack, the high pressure oil will, you know, be pressed into that uh, oil crack and make the oil crack bigger and bigger and suddenly you'll, you'll create a spall, a big area that will fall off the bearing. Um, cavitation can also happen. That's typically starting on the suction side of a pump. If you have water droplets in the oil, the water will turn into vapor or steam. And then when it gets into the, uh, the pump, you'll get cavitation problems like you see in, you know, when you're having air and so on. This is just vapor, but it's the same problem. And the last word here, weird <laughs> word, hydrogen embrittlement. What it means is that you're having hydrogen ions and hydrogen in the oil. You know, water consists of H2O. So when the hydrogen are migrating into the, the steel, it becomes brittle, like glass. And then you can, you know, if you have a shock in a gear, for example, you can uh, break a tooth because it's so brittle and, and gear teeth need to be flexible or ductile but they will not be if there's a lot of hydrogen in them. Um, so um, water will cause these problems, but of course it will also cause corrosion. It will cause speeding up of degradation. We'll go back to what degradation or oxidation is uh, and varnish. It can deplete additives because very um, uh, a lot of the additives are actually uh, being, can be washed out with oil because they are uh, polar, set to the P, for example, can be destroyed with water. Um, you can create bacteria growth if you have enough of water there. And, um, and yeah, the micro pitting will look like this. So I'll show you a couple of photos here from, from uh, Danish Wind Power Academy. Just take a sip of water. Um, so this is from a, a wind turbine, but it could be any other gear where you have water coming in. So initially the first phase is these micro cracks, so micro pitting, and then hydrogen embrittlement. And these are, you know, bigger than um, fingernails. So big chunks of, uh, of metal are, are jumping off. Here's again zooming in on the racetrack in a bearing. You can see the micro pitting or the micro crack. This uh, the other here is uh, from Timken Bearing. Now, uh, this is there supplying a lot of bearings to um, water contaminated systems like in steel mills and paper mills. So, but you can get similar from, from uh, FAC and FK and SQF and the other manufacturers. If you look at the, the life for the bearing here, so the, the L10 or the nominal life they look at, that is based on 100 parts per million of water in the oil or 0.01%. So very little amount of oil. If you add a thousand parts per million or 0.1%, you can see the curve goes quickly down. So about a thousand parts per million, you are, have only 25% life of the bearing left. So you have just destroyed 75% of the life just by adding some water. And it's actually very little amount of water. You can calculate yourself what is a, um, uh, 0 0.01 percent uh, in an, an oil system with a few hundred gallons. It's a very little amount of water that it tolerates. And there's a lot of bearings out there that are running with way, way too much water in them. You may 
remember that we typically say oil and water uh, don't mix, but a little bit of water can actually normally be mixed into oil. That is uh, the, the dissolved state, so a few hundred parts per million can typically be mixed. So if I added some uh, water to an oil that was uh, you know, running at, at the normal temperature, so maybe from yeah, 150 Fahrenheit or something like that, uh, or maybe slightly colder. But but uh, in that in that region, 100 to 150, you can add some hundred parts per million to that oil. So that's like humidity in air. You will probably have something like 70 percent humidity in the room you're sitting, and uh, you cannot see it. It's it's just dissolved in the air. Then if I add more water to the oil, I could create what is called an emulsion that will be similar to fog in the air. So there you can start to see the, uh, the, the could I say, small globules of, uh, of oil molecules that are actually creating like small, no, yeah, small bubbles in there. And that will um, be some types of oil. So engine oil will create a lot of these uh, emulsified uh, engine oil. Uh, you probably all know as it looks like mayonnaise or something, you know, caramel sauce. Uh, and if I add more water, then I'll have free water coming out. But that is uh, not the same oil type. So uh, turbine oil will typically go directly from the dissolved state to free water. It will not create any emulsions. Uh, and the many gear oils and so on will not either. Uh, while if you have um, uh, engine oil, it will not create free, free water unless you go to something like 30% water. Because of that, there's uh, um, some uh, international recognized water targets. So in hydraulic oil, you typically should aim at 200 ppm. For diesel or gas oil, 300 ppm. Gear oil, around f uh, 500. Uh, these environmental acceptable lubricants uh, based on esters, 1,000 or slightly less. And engine lube oil or glycols, 2,000. Um, the glycols are are very hygroscopic, so absorb uh, humidity from the air, and they can take quite a lot of water before it actually start to create emulsions or, or free water. The most important thing for all oil system is that you will not have emulsions or free water, because that will create the, the problems we just discussed. Noria also made a table for water, similar to we had one for particles. So out here in the left side, the gray area, I have the current moisture level. And then it's slightly different made. So here I have the, uh, the moisture level that I want to uh, in the table. And then my life extension is in the red area here. Uh, and this is for uh, bearings and gears and so on, where you have high um, could I say pressure load zones. So if I took a system with a, a 2,500 parts per million and clean it to about 150 ppm, you can see I'll go here, go sideways, now 156, very accurate in this table, and then it gives me five times longer life. So that would be for a gear, for example, I could expect that. Now you could ask me, now if I clean both water and particle, will I then be adding five, like, five times longer life due to the water and then four times longer life due to particles, for example. Well, in theory, yes, you can add them, but normally I would never do that. I would uh, talk to you and say, what is your biggest issue? Uh, if you're talking as a steel mill, paper mill or something where water is just flushing in, I would focus on the water and then I would say, well, the, the here you can get five times longer life if, if we would use the water level then the particles would just be an extra add-on that you will get some extra, but how much will not look at that. If you had another application where you had a lot of dirt coming in, like a cement mill or a, a crusher or something else where there was a lot of dirt, I would focus on the, the particles and disregard the water and then say, okay, you got four or five times longer life due to the particles. So that's typically how I would do it. Because when you look at adding them and you have eight, nine, ten times longer life just by uh, cleaning the oil, it gets a little too weird, a little too theoretically. So therefore, I would normally pick one of them, and still the business case is fantastic. Uh, so um, that's what I would normally recommend. So the last of the contamination here um, is aging of oil or degradation of oil. Uh, now, 
oil is a natural product like milk for example and it can go off you know milk has a, a certain shelf life so when milk goes off it's typically due to temperature the same with oil the higher the temperature the faster it degrades uh, or oxidizes is also called because you need to have oxygen present otherwise it's yeah it's not it's not oxidizing or it's not degrade, degrading um, the more particles and the more water you have, the faster the oil will degrade. Primarily because my particles are actually creating wear, uh, so you're getting hot spots in the load zone that are getting hot and destroying the, the oil and also creating wear, more wear. So it's like a exponential growth of, of uh, amount of particles. Uh, also, my particles and water can actually um, deplete my additives they can the zinc and phosphorus for example set the dp here and sulfur phosphorus that's in in ghee oil they will cling on to a particle and take a ride and go out to the bottom for example so and the these particles that are designed to cling on to a gear they cannot see the difference between the steel in the gear and a steel particle that is floating in the oil so they will take a ride on the particle or the water and they will fall to the bottom well you could then say then some of the filters will take the additives mm, yes but if you don't have any filter then you'll just destroy it even more so the particles will uh, you know take some of the additives so the you need to get the particles out as fast as possible the more particles you have the more the additives you will deplete um, so when you're depleting your additives you're getting yeah, uh, a shorter uh, oil life and you need to change the oil. So you will create acidity, sludge and varnish when the oil degrades. I'll just show you uh, here. So when oil degrades, you'll have acidity like milk. You know, you can smell milk that is off and it smells really bad. Um, so the contamination uh, will create something called sludge or resin, which is typically dissolving in warm oil. So if you have a, an oil of like a 100 Fahrenheit typically around that temperature, most of the varnish is actually not pleated out as varnish, but will be dissolved in the oil. Uh, when the temp temperature lowers, you will create these varnish deposits um, and most likely the uh, viscosity will also increase. You see some photos. Now this is very, very hot. Uh, uh, could you say burned oil so this is more like a thermal cracking and not typically how varnish is looking i'll show you these instead so this is how varnish looks in a hydraulic system if you just pull the plug so this is looking into the uh, uh, the oil sump and here they just pull the plug and you can see there's a, a lot of varnish and particles sticking here now this if i don't remove that my new oil will actually dissolve this back into solution and then I'll be pumping it around in my system. If I have varnish on a hydraulic system, this is a steering machine on a ship, or if I have it here in a plate heat exchanger, I can of course create problems. So the most uh, obvious reason for, for varnish uh, consequences is when you're having fine valves that are sticking or you lose control, so the valves cannot move. There's very little you know, um, tolerances in, the, in, the, in a valve, so between uh, the, the, the plunger, moving plunger in the center of the valve and, and the, the housing it says, so it's, it's very easy to, to lose control over that valve. Also, if you have an inline filter, a very fine filter, you can restrict the flow because it's partially blocked with the varnish. Um, this is also referred to as sandpaper surface. So this, if you see this, uh, and that of course is a sticky layer with particles in, that's very abrasive. Uh, if you insulate a cooler like that, it will lose the efficiency and you'll actually get hotter oil that can kill the oil quicker. Uh, and you can even bake it onto bearings or uh, so thrust bearings, for example, in the turbine, or you've also seen it maybe in an engine on the liner. You can bake it onto a, like a lacquer, and that can actually wear the engine quicker and start to use oil. So oil is uh, with varnish is uh, costing a lot of money. It uh, means you lose availability and revenue, and you need to change the oil. So varnish is also quite costly for systems. So we have, now oh, here's just a few photos of on a gearbox, on an engine, and a, a valve here. Now it's difficult to see, I know, but this is, a, a, there's more soot in this engine has been cleaned up. You can see it's yellow here.
So you have a, a really bad combination of uh, three things in most systems. So you have abrasive wear, so particles are destroying my, my surfaces. I have maybe some water that creates cavitation and pist pitting, and then I have water uh, varnish issues. So these three things are, are, are big problems for most machines. There are some systems that also have issues with fuel, so that will be an engine, for example, uh, where you where you're getting fuel into the to the engine oil. Um, now, fuel is a, a completely different chemical properties than oil, uh, so it doesn't have the additives and so on. Uh, so you can create uh, big problems and very fast uh, degradation of the oil. Most uh, problem is in regards to uh, viscosity because fuel diesel, for example, has much lower viscosity than engine lube oil. So you'll be decreasing the viscosity and create really bad, you know, it's called adhesive wear in your bearings. Uh, if you're running the engine on heavy fuel, you'll see an increase in viscosity, which is also bad. Um, your flash point will also be harmed. Uh, mostly oil will have a flash point about 240, 250 C. So what's that in Fahrenheit for, I think, 400 or something like that. But it can get uh, very, very low if you have too much ingression of fuel. Uh, in, in fact, so da dangerously low that you can have a fire in the engine. And that's, of course, not good in the engine sump. Um, so it could be from a, a leaking fuel pump or a nozzle or, like you see here, cracked injector or the needle valve you have in the and a common rail diesel engine can also be leaking fuel into the engine or like this one show a poor spray pattern where you're not atomizing the the fuel but more like sending a, a you know a, a flow of fuel in um, in the in the combustion chamber fuel will also have problems uh, with your filter you need to uh, replace your filter. You can also have water in the fuel that will create microbes or diesel pests it's called uh, and of course pitting and wear on your your injectors and pumps. Uh, this is a, a diesel pest you have here so this is the diesel feeding of the uh, uh, the diesel pest feeding of the uh, of the diesel and then when the microbes die they become like slimy stuff here in the bottom and you don't want that in your engine or in your filters. Um, you'll also have sandblasting of your fuel pumps and injectors and so on, the more dirt you have in the, in the uh, fuel, um, and ineffective combustions, and so you'll be using more fuel. Um, so dirty fuel can easily cost a lot of money. And now, if you look at a vessel or you look at a, uh, a mine site or something where they're using a lot of engines or gensets, um, very quickly you can spend a hundred thousand US dollars on new injectors, new pumps and so on yearly. Uh, I've seen some uh, areas where they say uh, the uh, injector life would be normally 18 to 20 thousand hours um, but if they're having issues with dirty fuel you're seeing two to four thousand hours of injector life. So you are almost getting a tenth of the of the injector life compared to what it should be. So huge amount of money you can spend on that. Yes, so when you have dirty oil, it will exponentially create more and more wear in your system. And like I said in the start, studies have shown that the majority of breakdowns are actually due to contaminated oil. So some particles that are getting in will create more wear, more particles. So we need to get rid of this as soon as possible. So you can actually do that by thinking three types of, of filters. Um, so you should stop the ingression of dirt and water. So you need to have some kind of air vent or breeder system that makes sure the, the air that uh, the system is breathing in is free from particles and water. Uh, also, the system needs to be completely sealed. I mean, you, you don't have a, a manhole cover open, for example. So uh, seals on your covers uh, and um, good seals on the other uh, open areas so you don't get dirt in. Uh, you may think that most systems are, it's only hydraulic systems that are breathing, but actually most systems are breathing because of the, the temperature changes. So if a system is warm, uh, the warm air takes more room, but when the air is getting cold and the oil is getting cold, it will actually takes less room and therefore it will suck in new amount of air. And if that air is dirty uh, or wet, then you'll get the 
the dirt and water into your oil system. Then you also need to have an inline filter, a pressure filter here after the main pump. This is the last chance for the uh, to stop the dirt getting into the system. And you can combine that with an offline filter that runs 24-7 from the most contam contaminated area here. I will just show it in, in a different way here. So if you look at the 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 particles here and the uh, the, the percentage here, maybe you, you remember this curve here, so they have the, and so if your inline filters is something like 6 to 30 micron, you're taking the bigger particles, but you're still leaving a lot of the small ones left. Uh, so your offline filter could be taking care of 3 micron or smaller, so you're taking much more of the, the whole curve here of particles. And your breeder may be a desiccant breeder if you're in a humid area. Uh, the one I've just shown here is with a, a bladder on the top, it's called a hybrid breeder. So the bladder is contracting and expanding depending on the uh, you know, the normal breathing and then a non vitel male will open if there's a lot of breathing going on and you'll suck uh, through the filter and the desiccant here to take the water out. So typically your best combination uh, for total protection and the cheapest way to clean uh, an oil is actually to have a 10 or 12 micron breeder, a 10 micron inline filter and a 3 micron offline filter. Yes, so this system here, what is the difference between those two types of filters? So my inline pleated filter and my offline depth media. If we look at the inline filters first, they are typically a very shin, thin uh, sheets of uh, pleated filters, you know, pleated like you can see here, to get as big surface area as possible. Here the full flow is most important and your low differential pressure. That calls for a thin media. If I had a very thick, very dense media in my full flow filter, my uh, that would mean I would maybe lose, you know, many hundred psi or thousands of psi on the way and of course i don't want that my main pump should not be delivering an extra amount of psi just because the filter is taking some so here the filter needs to have um, a low differential pressure over the filter as possible and of course it needs to hold back as many pos as many particles in one pass single pass as possible so here your beta rating or your uh, your efficiency in one pass is of course important. But your depth media that you have in your offline or your kidney loop circle, um, there it's much more important that you have room for particles. So if you have higher differential pressure, it doesn't matter. You need a thick media that can take m as much dirt as possible. So room for particle, also water and varnish if possible. So taking all your contamination out. Some filter types are even possible to take out acidity. Uh, so, you know, uh, here you're in your pleated, your inline filter, you want the low differential pressure. And in your depth media, the kidney loop, it doesn't matter if the differential pressure is bigger because you have your own pump and you decide the flow rate. Um, why are people using cellulose? For example, C.C. Jensen is using cellulose. Well, if you look at the surface area, so specific surface area for the uh, cellulose type that uh, CTC filters are made of, they have 120 square meters per gram. That is very difficult to understand. Um, but if you compare it to glass fiber and synthetic polymers that are used in pleated inline filters, they have about 10 square meters per gram. This uh, is crazy numbers. You could think, think that this is the best in the world, but it's actually not. If you look at activated carbon, there's about 300 square meters per gram, up to 1,000 square meters per gram. Even in your lungs, you have 70 square meters of specific area. And I look at myself, there's not 70 square meters on that. That's like 700 square feet in my lungs. But it's, of course, because you have all these small, you know, hairs or whatever you want to call it in your lungs and the same with the cellulose there's these tiny hairs on a on a each cellulose fiber so there's a lot of specific area uh, so the whole fiber has uh, the whole uh, filter has a lot of cavities where the particles get trapped and uh, that is much much larger than uh, a glass fiber or melt blown uh, 
pleated filter. And also, because cellulose can absorb water and varnish, uh, adhere, it's called, it adheres to the surface of the fibers and then absorbed into the fibers. So you get three in one uh, and even four in one if you have a sensitive removal as well. Um, so um, if you just do a calculation, uh, a CTC insert called the, the B2727, that weighs uh, 3,600 grams, that is equal to 60 football fields of surface area. That is crazy. Um, so if you if you think about it in layman terms, then you're you're taking oil and you're pouring out on the table in front of you. That will be your your pleated inline filter. That will be your table. So if that would be a membrane or mesh, you want to pour the oil out on the table and let it seep through, and then that's how you clean it. If you're using a CDC filter, you're pouring the same amount of oil over a football field, and obviously you're getting much bigger area to, where, the, uh, where the oil can seep through and therefore you got room for much more dirt, much more water and varnish and particles and all that. Um, that's why we're, we're using cellulose. If you zoom in on the glass fiber versus cellulose fibers here, you can see this is uh, glass fibers here, quite uniform in sizes here and they, what obstruct the, um, the particles is obviously, you know, how uh, the big the holes are here. If you zoom in on uh, cellulose, uh, CTC cellulose, you can see there's some big structural fibers here. They're about 20, little less than 20 micron. They are the ones that are could say, holding the, the fibers in place. And then there's a lot of tiny, tiny ones. These are called nanofibers. This is uh, actually a patent or secret from CC Ensign. So that helps you to do much finer filtration uh, and to take as much varnish and, and particles and water out as possible. This is why you can do something like that. Uh, here, a startup or hydraulic system here, you cannot see through the bottle, the, uh, um, the tape on the wall. After four and a half hours, you start to see it, and after 24 hours, you have removed the particles and the varnish from that. And that is only because you're using this uh, depth mate here that can take the varnish and the particles out. Yes. That was what I planned for uh, for my minutes, and yes, the the time is definitely gone. So I'll be uh, uh, I'll be uh, stop.